the pharmaceutical industry didn't always have a bad reputation. For decades, it was seen as one of the best ways to extend life expectancy. But in the 1990s, a combination of events changed things completely. It was the end of the triumph of chemistry and the beginning of the patent problem. Expiries, generics, development difficulties, prices that started shooting up. The big Western countries, the United States, didn't want to pay through the nose for drugs anymore. That's when Merck executives decided to cross the red line and cheat the system. Bernard Delberg uses the term red line deliberately. He's referring to a case dating back 10 years, the Vioxx lawsuit. It's one of the biggest drug scandals of the 20th century. Vioxx was a drug for arthritis, the chronic joint illness that affects millions of people. Merck presented Vioxx as a groundbreaking drug. Vioxx was a super aspirin that was supposed to be groundbreaking in that, unlike other anti-inflammatories, it had fewer digestive side effects. All the scientific literature on Vioxx at the time was extremely positive, both fundamentally and in terms of the clinical trials. These trials demonstrated without a shadow of a doubt that it was as efficient and sometimes more efficient than other super aspirins of the time, with fewer digestive secondary effects and a general tolerance that seemed pretty good, in particular on a cardiovascular level. So it was clearly progress. Everyone believed in it. And then people started dying. The scandal broke in the early 2000s, when dozens of Americans testified on TV that they or their relatives had had a heart attack after taking Vioxx. Carol Ernst's husband, a 59-year-old marathon runner, died from it. In 2001, she filed the first complaint against Merck. Consumers have the right to know what the risks are when you take a drug. The country's greatest lawyers instantly jumped on the case. One of them was Christopher Seeger, a class action specialist. His first task was to find out what the scientific community thought about Vioxx, a task more difficult than it appeared. In 2001, there was an article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA. And that article was just basically what they said is they took a look at Vioxx and they basically said, we have a red flag here. I can't, we, we're not gonna say there's really something going on, but we think there's a red flag. We've looked at the science. We've looked at people who've had problems. You know, first you wanna find out if there's a biological plausibility. So if somebody says a drug causes something, it's good to hear from a scientist that there, there's some biological plausibility. Yeah, I see how that can happen. And that happened with Vioxx. Well, one of the most difficult things about that case for me at the time is I had a hard time finding experts who would say anything bad about Merck. Several researchers were in fact working to determine whether this drug was or was not dangerous for the heart. But if no researchers were talking, it was because on the other end, Merck was doing whatever it could to smother the growing scandal. What they said was they wanted to neutralize the opposition. Merck wasn't exactly happy uh, to have, have people have doubts. Um, and I know there were various instances where they either tried to persuade people or they tried to gain the, um, uh, the support of people um, for the drug, uh, but not by showing evidence that the drug was better. So it was... Uh, to use the influence of money to influence them to be more favorable to their drug. A document seized at Merck after the first complaints were filed illustrated the way the company was influencing leading American physicians. It revealed that the laboratory was using its financial power to buy them. 
The document mentioned $50,000 in funding, as well as studies commissioned by Merck for some of its drugs, and doctors requesting large honorariums to support the company. Standard practice, according to Bernard d'Alberg. Dans toute ma carrière, uh, j'ai vu peut-être un ou deux. In my whole career, I've seen maybe one or two people resist offers of transversal collaboration. Let's use that modest term. The thing is, they've got a problem. They have to find funding for their own research, at least, even if they don't want to work with manufacturers. So they're forced to work with them. Unfortunately, they have no other choice. Merck literally launched a campaign against those doctors, not just to discredit them with the science, but they discredited them on a very personal level. They tried to make them look like they were buffoons, like they didn't understand the science, and they attacked them. One particular scientist who was critical of the drug, they tried to get him fired from the university he was associated with. Neutralize in the common parlance would be a word that the CIA or the Mafia would use. David Egelman served as an expert in some of the complaints filed against Mayock. He's read all of the studies and classified documents related to Viox. The Mafia would break your leg or your arm. The CIA would shoot you. And in Merck's case, um, they either offered people incentives or they, if that wasn't an approach that was amenable to the controlling the person who was speaking badly about Viox, they would um, try to discredit them. I don't think that's a very scientific approach to uh, the truth. There's no reliable scientific evidence in this case that Viox had anything to do with uh, Mr. Ernst's tragic death. Um, there, um, it just simply doesn't exist. Despite the company's denials, by September 2004, the scandal had grown so great that Merck decided to stop production of Viox. We are voluntarily withdrawing Viox effective today. And we're taking this action because we believe it best serves the interests of patients. We believe it would have been possible to continue to market Viox with labeling that would incorporate these new data. However, given the availability of alternative therapies and the questions raised by the data, we concluded that a voluntary withdrawal is the responsible course to take. I want to hear about Dr. Graham's study today. What really pushed Merck to take its drug off the market, in fact, was an irrefutable study done by this man, David Graham, a researcher at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, good morning. My name is David Graham, and I'm pleased to come before you today to speak about Vioxx, heart attacks, and the FDA. This report estimated that nearly 28,000 excess cases of heart attack and sudden cardiac death had been caused by Vioxx. I must emphasize to the committee that this is an extremely conservative estimate. This estimate ranges from 88,000 to 139,000 Americans. Of these, 30 to 40 percent probably died. For the survivors, their lives were changed forever. Today, in 2004, we are faced with what may be the single greatest drug safety catastrophe in the history of this country. I strongly believe that this should have been, and largely could have been, avoided. But it wasn't. An important message for people who have taken... After this statement, the Vioxx commercials that had flooded American televisions were replaced by ads from lawyers offering to sue Merck. After taking Vioxx, may be... But the company was suspected not just of having tried to silence Vioxx's critics, but more importantly, to have covered up the drug's lethal effects. 1-877-308-7900. And emails, you know, tell a very revealing story. You know, I know that people say, oh, I just wrote something at midnight, I was just, I was tired. But when you start to see email if, after email, and some of these that go back to the mid-90s when they're developing the drug, where scientists in the company are saying, before they ever put it in the first person, that there is a potential for this kind of problem. And then they did studies in mice, and they saw problems. And then they did studies in people, and they saw problems. 
Indeed, internal emails showed that before Vioxx was commercialized, Merck had already recorded a number of deaths from heart attacks. It's clear that Merck deliberately lied about the study results and deliberately hid for years the fact that there were cardiovascular deaths. Laboratories are the only ones to have the structural and financial resources to be able to pay for these trials. So you have to understand that they control everything. To show a side effect that happens in one out of a thousand people, it has to be tested in nearly 50,000 people. There isn't a pharmaceutical company out there that does that kind of testing before they sell. The real testing ground is you and me and our parents and our wives and our children. Apart from Merck's responsibility, the American authorities wanted to know if the lab had received any special favors, in particular from the FDA, the American Drug Administration. Some of this the FDA knew, even though it wasn't public, because the FDA had access to non-public data. So if it was obvious, then it wasn't just Merck's mistake, it was the FDA's mistake too. So in many ways, the government agent, the regulatory agency and the company have to work together to say, we were shocked there was gambling in Casablanca. It was again David Graham who revealed the relations between Merck and the FDA. In his statement before the Senate, he openly condemned the attempts at intimidation he experienced at his agency. Uh, we'll do a second round and last round of this panel so we can move on. Uh, Dr. Graham? I was pressured to change my conclusions and recommendations. One drug safety manager recommended that I should be barred from presenting the poster at the meeting and also noted that Merck needed to know our study results. So I guess Merck needed to know the results, but the public didn't. Thank you, Dr. Graham. The meeting adjourned. The biggest problem is its uh, social interaction with the companies, let's say. Okay? So in, in terms of Vioxx, for example, which is similar, there's one physician at the FDA who's in charge. Okay? Now, that physician at the FDA is dealing with the Merck people, and they have a whole army of people. So they develop a social relationship, right? All right? And, and nothing, you know, and, and so they don't want to, they don't want to get in a, would you want to be working with someone and having fights every week? Honig, who was in charge of Vioxx, went to work for Merck. He left work on a Friday, and he went to work at Merck on the next Monday, two days later, okay? That's what he did. He said in his deposition, he decided over the weekend to leave. He said he tried to recuse himself. Tried. Okay? He tried. In November 2007, in the United States, Merck agreed to settle the lawsuits. On the news line right now, helping us react to the, the Merck settlement, $4.85 billion related to the Biox painkiller suit. Uh, they do not admit uh, causation or fault. This deals with half the plaintiffs, a third of the cases. Some estimates were $50 billion if you added up all the number crunching here. Merck signed an agreement to compensate victims in exchange for no fault being imputed to the company. Did we get a legal admission of fault? No. Uh, there's nothing in a document where they say we did this, we're sorry. But I think that was a nice way to say I'm sorry also, you know, by paying the victims of their, um, of their wrongdoing. When you pay $4.85 billion, anybody out there listening to this, if you think that's not an admission of fault, you're wrong. These are companies that want to make money. They don't want to spend money. And if they spend money, they want to spend it on making new products. So for any pharmaceutical company, particularly one that makes nine or $10 billion, and I understand that's a lot of money, but for them to pay f almost half of that out, almost $5 billion, is an admission of fault. The paradox of the American justice system is that officially, despite this agreement, no one could be held responsible for the deaths that occurred among Vioxx users, especially not Raymond Gilmartin, Merck's CEO at the time. I don't think anybody was technically fired, but many of the senior executives who were around during Vioxx left. Ray Gilmartin, who was the CEO of the company, retired and went on to other things. Very rich men, by the way. 
um, you know, because they had stock options and they owned an interest in the company. And when they retired, they were able to sell those and retire very comfortably, much more comfortably than it, most of the people who got compensation through the program. On Wall Street, the Vioxx affair had little effect on investors. Stocks wavered briefly, then everything returned to normal. Shares even increased in value. When the Vioxx scandal broke, Merck's market capitalization was around 40 to 50 billion dollars. Today, if financial websites are to be believed, it's worth 140 billion dollars. That means one thing that despite the Vioxx scandal, which was, I repeat, the greatest drug scandal the planet has ever known, despite enormous fines, despite the company's atrocious image, it continues to grow and in 10 years has tripled its market capitalization. That's something a lot of companies dream of.